Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Quantopian uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to read you an abstract and a summary of the talk. Um, in this webinar, we will discuss a theoretical case study done in conjunction with an institutional investor to demonstrate how one can use deep neural networks for tactical asset allocation. Two very different ways of portfolio construction, one based on expected returns and uncertainty, and the other which obtains allocations as part of the neural network and optimizes a custom utility function, such as a port portfolio sharp, are shared. The objective is to share the process and the nuances involved in practical implementation. Finally, the results show how the deep learning strategies trained in walk forward manner um, have a comparable performance to traditional framework currently used by CIOs. From this talk, participants will gain a better understanding of how AI strategies can be implemented to assist CIOs um, with tactical asset allocation decisions, business drivers for allocators uh, when considering an AI-driven approach to asset management and deployment and scalability related uh, practical challenges for a machine learning strategy. Um, now, um, we'll hear a bio of uh, the speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Marissa Palestino. I'm a member of the client relations team at Key Plum. Our speaker today, Calvin Yu, is the managing director and head of multi-asset solutions at Key Plum. Calvin has over 12 years experience in multi-asset investing. Prior to joining Key Plum, he worked at Goldman Sachs as lead portfolio manager and outsourced chief investment officer, managing multi-asset portfolios for institutional investors. As a brief background on QPlum, we're an AI-driven asset manager using deep learning in research development and implementation of systematic investment strategies to manage portfolios for institutional investors and high net worth clients. We invest and manage assets for individuals and institutions using systematic AI-driven investment strategies across all major asset classes. I'll now hand over the presentation to Calvin to begin our webinar on use of deep learning in tactical asset allocation. Thanks, Marissa. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure speaking to you all today. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, like uh, was mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available. And also we'll save general Q&A towards the end of the presentation. Um, so the topic of today's uh, presentation is on the use of deep learning in tactical asset allocation strategies. Now, AI has certainly been a hot topic in recent times. Technology is advancing at an exponential rate, and it's really amazing how technology has helped in our daily lives today compared to just 10 years ago. Um, if you think about it, we're already using AI in many parts of our daily lives today from, say, Netflix has learned about your preferences and designs a custom playlist recommending you what shows to watch. And similarly, Amazon suggests what things to buy and Google helps navigate your daily lives and so on. Now, just take a moment and imagine what we can achieve if we were to apply artificial intelligence in investment management. So um, by way of introduction, I'm Calvin Yu. I head up multi-asset solutions at QPlum, where I work with in institutional investors to design investment strategies using our AI framework. I've been in the multi-asset portfolio management space for about a dozen years, and I started off at JP Morgan. I helped launch an uh, OCIO, or Outsourced Chief Investment Officer business within the investment bank. Uh, this business started off as an idea, and we had no clients back in 07, but we steadily grew and um, was later on acquired by Pacific Life, Pacific Life and then subsequently acquired by Goldman Sachs. And so for three years, I was a lead portfolio manager at Goldman Sachs where I managed institutional multi-asset portfolios and I worked with many CIOs of large multi-billion dollar pension plans and other institutional investors. A little bit of background on QPlum. So QPlum was founded in late 2014 um, by Mansi and Gaurav. Uh, so Mansi and Gaurav, just a little bit of background on them. They were both pursuing their master's in computer science with a focus on artificial intelligence applications in finance back in the early 2000s. And then uh, when they graduated, Gaurav joined a high frequency trading firm called Tower Research Capital. And there he was uh, one of the early members but established one of the most profitable trading groups at Tower Research Capital uh, and became the youngest partner there. He helped develop a, a group that initially started off with just him to develop systematic trading strategies. And it, this team grew to a team of over 50 plus engineers during that period of time. Mency, the other co-founder, she um, was uh, following more of a traditional financial career where she did trading at different investment banks 
and eventually ended up at Brevin Howard, uh, a large global macro hedge fund, where she was a portfolio manager there. And between Mansi and Gaurav, they, they saw that artificial intelligence was changing and disrupting so many industries, and that maybe it would be helpful for them to to launch this new company, Qplum, to make asset management more efficient by using some of these systematic artificial intelligence strategies. And so today, Qplum, we're a technology-focused firm with a team of engineers and data scientists. We provide asset management services for individuals and institutions using our systematic AI-driven investment strategies and invest across all major asset classes. And so um, I've, I've worked with many CIOs over the years, and as the chief investment officer of an institution, the most fundamental objective is to achieve strong risk-adjusted returns. Now, it doesn't matter if you're managing a pension plan or an endowment, a foundation, a sovereign wealth fund. One of the primary goals of the CIO is ge to generate good performance on those assets. But that's no easy feat. Uh, there are many challenges that CIOs face, and I've outlined three uh, common challenges I often hear from the CIOs that I've worked with in the past. So the first challenge is today's low yielding environment. Uh, investment returns are built up from the risk-free rate, but risk-free rates around the world are at historic lows today, making it very challenging to achieve those high target rates of returns that are stated in many investment policy statements. The second challenge is outdated capital market assumptions. So a lot of different institutional investors, they develop strategic asset allocations every couple of years based on long-term capital market assumptions, which are developed using backward-looking historical data. But in today's fast-changing markets, the strategic asset allocation developed a couple of years ago using those outdated capital market assumptions may not be applicable today, which leads to the third challenge, which is delays in acting on those tactical opportunities. So as I just mentioned, our markets are dynamically changing in real time. I've, I've outlined in this chart here uh, towards the right, um, the performance of the best to the worst asset classes for each calendar year. And as you can see, there is no pattern. Um, the best performing asset class in one year can be the worst in the next. Markets are constantly evolving and changing in real time, and many CIOs find it really challenging to convene their investment committees and quickly decide how to act on those tactical opportunities in a timely manner. But the good news is we feel that some of these challenges can be addressed using AI, and not only that, I think with the advent of big data and stronger computing power, we feel that these problems can be addressed using AI today. So in today's talk, I'd like to cover three main points. The first is that artificial intelligence and specifically deep learning is really good at mapping out complex relationships within the financial markets. The second point is asset allocation is the biggest driver of portfolio performance and deep learning can be a great tool for tactical asset allocation. And the third is that deep learning can be a great tool for many other areas of portfolio management at the, the CIO office as well. So again, to summarize those three points, one, deep learning is, a great, is great at mapping out complex relationships. Two, deep learning can be a great tool for tactical asset allocation. And three, deep learning can be a great tool for many other areas of portfolio management. So coming to the first point on how deep learning is great at mapping out complex relationship, let's spend a moment and talk about what we mean by artificial intelligence and deep learning. So now artificial intelligence is a broad universe of strategies. In this webinar, we're, uh, we've outlined deep learning and neural networks specifically, which are types of machine learning strategies. And we use these as illustrative sets of strategies. But before diving into how deep learning can help uh, with developing investment solutions, I'll just provide a little bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with how they work. So neural networks overall are loosely inspired by the human brain. So if you think about what's happening with your brain right now, you're looking at this computer screen and if you think about it, what's what's happening is there's all this light that's reflected off of uh, the computer screen and, and, and hitting into your eyes and into your retinas. And, and from there, your brain registers all of that input. Now, from all of that light particles, it draws patterns. So the first pattern it sees is um, all this, these light particles may be forming lines and edges. So it sees all these different lines and edges. And then the next layer, it takes those lines and edges and combines it to form different patterns and shapes. So maybe a horizontal line, a vertical line, another horizontal line, another vertical line, that now forms a rectangle. Okay, your brain registers that. The next layer beyond that would be, okay, I, I see that this is a rectangle and given the light and the reflection, and the texture and so forth, I know that this is a computer screen. The next layer beyond that could be, okay, I see that this is a computer screen and this is a slide that I'm looking at and it talks about 
um, artificial intelligence, da, 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 da. And so your brain is registering all this information and summarizing all of this information so that your brain can distill the important pieces of information uh, that you need to focus on. So now, uh, if, if, you, if you think about it, um, these neural networks uh, from a computer and AI kind of a setting are, are set to emulate that same process that goes on in your brain. There are inputs and then there are layers to summarize that information to determine the output. There is a simple calculation that takes place within each neuron that then gets passed through an activation function. And you can think of that as a nonlinear transformation. This process is automated and continues until we reach the end of the, the network, which helps you find that output. And it is a combination of a bunch of simple calculations that allow, it, uh, allow us to understand complex relationships in the data. And what ends up happening is that neural networks build up layers of complexity as they go deeper into the network. They are learning hidden representations of our data, and this ultimately allows us to model quite complicated relationships in our data. And if you were to translate that into markets, now the inputs could be all sorts of financial information to map out those relationships in the markets. So inputs can be market information from equity prices or fixed income prices and trading volumes, macroeconomic data, and so forth. Then each layer summarizes information to get to the output, which can then um, help predict returns or detect the regime or determine different trading strategies and so forth. Um, the markets are very complicated. Now, oftentimes there are hidden representations in our data that we are unaware of and we need a powerful al algorithm to truly model that. Um, now, overfitting is a big risk and a big concern when using such powerful models such as neural networks, but there are some precautions that you can take to mitigate this risk and, and we talk a little bit about that in this presentation. So to recap on that first point, it is deep learning is a great tool in mapping out complex relationships, which then brings me to the second point, which is deep learning can be a great tool for tactical asset allocation. So we've published a white paper outlining one of our strategies for using deep learning and tactical asset allocation. And this white paper shows a simplified version of one of the many AI driven strategies we use at Qplum, but it acts as a good example to illustrate the main concepts. I won't go over the white paper in too much detail here, but the goal of this paper was to try and predict how different asset classes will do in different market environments using deep learning. So we set up a deep learning model to predict expected returns for different asset classes. And moreover, what we thought um, was important to gauge a level of uncertainty in the predictions. So we used a Monte Carlo dropout to ensure that the model doesn't overfit and the relationships were more generalized. And for those of you who are not familiar with dropout, so remember how we talked about those neural network and all those neurons that are connected to each other? So basically what dropout does is it randomly shuts off a number of them each time you run the network. And you can specify the percentage of the total neurons to shut off. So originally this was done as a form of regularization because um, by doing this during training, it allows your neural network to not depend on any one neuron in particular to make a prediction, which then helps uh, it generalize better and not overfit. But what we found is that um, you can use this during inference and run the network multiple times to get a distribution of possible predictions. And we, if, if we take the standard deviation of the predictions, then we have a measure of prediction uncertainty uh, which is what we do in this paper. So as you see in the diagram on this slide, this is an end-to-end -end approach to generating portfolio allocations using deep learning. The layers in blue represent the return prediction model. The green node uh, represents the uncertainty the, that we calculate um, with the Monte Carlo dropout. And we also track how uh, well the model predicts each asset class. So if the model predicts one asset class much more consistently than the other, then it should probably we should probably trust those predictions more. Then we combine the expected returns, the prediction uncertainty, and the prediction error into one last layer and that takes all of this into account in forming portfolio allocations. So you can see how the model uh, allocates to different asset classes over time based on the then current market regimes and the relationships in the deep learning model. And you can see it, so for example, de-risking during volatile periods and then quickly reallocating back to risky assets when the markets are starting to normalize. And you can see uh, how the model performs over time as well. And just a quick note, you will notice that the performance varies uh, between different runs. Without getting too technical, it's because each time we ran, um, uh, we randomly initialize the weights in the, in the neural network. So because each neural network had a different starting point, uh, and because we don't run it until convergence 
to prevent overfitting, uh, the network makes slight uh, different decisions between each run, but for the most part, the decisions are very consistent. And you can take the average of these runs to determine a composite strategy performance. But some of the, the other findings from this paper was, was quite interesting. So for instance, a deep neural network trained with no look ahead bias performed very similarly to risk parity, which is a thoroughly researched and handcrafted strategy. Um, also the architecture that was shown here uses a sharp ratio as the main utility function. But the great thing about this is you can specify any objective function that you want, which can help you design different investment solutions. So um, like I said, this is an end-to-end -end automated architecture, which is systematic and allows you to create different unique custom solutions in a very cost-effective manner. Um, and like I say, this is just one of many AI-driven strategies we use at Qplum, and we can overlay other strategies on top as well to make this an improved investment solution for the end investors. So um, what we have talked about so far has been pretty conceptual or theoretical, but we can now shift gears to talk about some real world applications of AI in portfolio management. So a real world application of deep learning and tactical asset allocation can be seen in Qplum's actual global tactical asset allocation portfolios during the, U during the US presidential election in 2016. Now this is a real live portfolio trading real capital and not a back test. So during the seven trading days leading up to the presidential election, we saw heightened volatility in the markets. Um, our, our portfolios have risk targets in place and because we target risk, the portfolios got out of risk seeking assets and reallocated to cash uh, in order to preserve capital in case there was some downside volatility. Now, after the election, markets seemed to more uh, behave more normally and implied market volatility came down. So the, the portfolio automatically reallocated back to risk seeking assets to not miss out on any market performance. And now this process was closely monitored by our, our PM team, but the whole process was automated and efficiently executed. So that's, that's one example of uh, an actual result of, of using deep learning in tactical asset allocation. But we can leverage the deep learning architecture to design custom tactical investment solutions as well. And so Qplum was asked by an institutional investor to design a set of custom risk targeted global tactical strategies based on the following specifications. So here, uh, I guess the strategy was a global tactical asset allocation strategy. The benchmark was based off of a set of different risk benchmarks based on the global market cap portfolio where it targeted volatility levels of 12% vol, an 8% vol, and a 4% volatility of the measure. Uh, the universe here were global equities, fixed income, and commodities. And the drawdown uh, and risk management was based on the client-specific uh, risk tolerance um, that we had through conversations. The implementation of this was via listed ETFs in a separately managed account. And they asked for us uh, to have this uh, hedge the currency risk dynamically using AI to reduce hedging costs. And they asked for this, this portfolio to be having daily liquidity. So you can see uh, the strategies performed in the initial set of back tests and the scenario analysis here. Um, we had a series of discussions uh, with this investor and iteratively talked to the investor to further finalize those sets of strategies to determine a risk targeted global tactical strategies that met their mandate and met their, their uh, goals and objectives. So to recap on the second point, deep learning can be a great tool for tactical asset allocation. But deep learning can also be applied to many other areas of investing as well. And this moves me to my third point, which is deep learning can be a great tool for many other areas of portfolio management. So, so far, everything we've talked about was in the multi-asset space, but these deep learning strategies can be worked uh, within an asset class as well. So, Qplum uh, was asked to design a custom multi-factor long-short equity strategy. And again, it was based on the following parameters where the strategy was a long-short 130-30 small mid-cap equity strategy. The benchmark here was the Russell 2500 growth. Uh, the universe was US small and mid-cap stocks. Uh, we were given an active risk budget of 2%. We wanted to be managed uh, a beta one to this benchmark with a, a portfolio turnover below 150%. Um, the implementation was via single name stocks in a separately managed account with daily liquidity. And you can see how the strategy performed in initial set of back tests and scenario analysis here as well. And even though the strategy was focused on one asset class in particular, so the small mid cap market, we were able to dynamically allocate between the different stocks in the benchmark using AI and using deep learning to develop this custom investment solution. So 
as you can see, deep learning can be a very flexible uh, tool, and if designed well, can be customized to different applications. I've also outlined three other examples here for illustration as well. So the first example is in liability-driven investing. So many different financial institutions have to manage both assets and liabilities. The assets may be invested in a liability hedging portfolio to mitigate liability risks, while the rest of the assets are deployed to a diversified return-seeking growth portfolio to generate strong returns. Now, like uh, the strategic asset allocation we talked about earlier, a lot of these asset liability studies are typically typically conducted every few years. And again, they use some dated assumptions, so they don't necessarily take live markets into account. And so deep learning can be used to dynamically allocate between the growth and liability hedging portfolios in order to take advantage of live market dynamics. The second example is in portfolio allocations across different investment managers or investment strategies. So for example, within international equities, a CIO may use four different managers. The CIO may decide to allocate between those managers based on the manager's style or their active risk or the correlations or whatnot. Now, deep learning can dynamically allocate between those different managers, taking those same considerations into account. And the third example is in portfolio construction for a sub-strategy. So for example, if you were to build a portfolio of direct investments in large cap stocks, and you, uh, you can use deep learning to construct the portfolio with a key focus on parameters like the volatility. So maybe you wanna limit uh, realized volatility to a certain level. You can limit downside risk to a certain target threshold. You might wanna target beta or correlations um, to make sure that the portfolio character characteristics and sensitivities to other parts of the portfolio are taken in, into account. You might want to target different uh, tracking error or active risk budgets, the different currency hedging or tax optimization considerations. You can dynamically construct a portfolio to best meet your needs using deep learning. So to recap on my, my third point in today's talk, which is deep learning can be a great tool for many other areas of portfolio management. So what did we cover today? Uh, one, deep learning is a great uh, tool in mapping out complex relationships. Two, deep learning can be a great tool for tactical asset allocation. And three, deep learning can be a great tool for many other areas of portfolio management. Um, we use AI in many other parts of our daily lives and systematic strategies have been around for decades. And we think AI is, is a great tool with proper design. It can be used uh, to add a lot of value to your portfolios and meet your, uh, your objectives. So it was a pleasure speaking to you all today. Feel free to reach out to me over email or check out our website or check out our white paper that I referenced. But I look forward to carrying on the conversation and seeing how we can use AI to help add value to your portfolios. Um, with that, I'd like to open up any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Calvin. Um, we'll now address some of the questions that we received during Calvin's pre presentation. Um, the first question is, Clarence asked, what kind of data do you use in developing your investment strategies? Thanks, Clarence. Um, uh, we, we use over half a dozen different uh, data sources or data providers to um, provide uh, different types of market information. So that could be price, um, volume, macroeconomic, and, and when I say the, the, all of these different things, they, they apply to all different asset classes from your equities, fixed income, currencies, commodities, um, all sorts of different asset classes. So. And, and within each one of these things, we look at, like, if, even if I look at the macroeconomic data and just looking at the non-farm payrolls number alone, instead of just looking at the headline uh, payroll number, we also look at all the underlying sets of information. And actually just the, the non-farm payrolls, the underlying data has over 200 different data points just in that payroll number alone. So, so as you can probably imagine, we look at a lot of different uh, market information. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time evaluating alternative data as well, but we have not found that data to be consistent or stable, or at least have the history to develop a robust set of investment strategies. So for now, we've uh, just kept it to more traditional market information. Our next question is from Steve. Interesting back-tested performance, but how is your realized performance in 2018? Thanks, Steve. Um, just a quick, quick note, uh, past performance is not indicative of future performance, but um, in our long-only global tactical asset allocation portfolios, um, because they are long-only, uh, we and, and because all assets were pretty much down last year, we had a, a varied set of ranges where, um, depend, it really depends on, on the risk target we're trying to target here, but it ranged from down 4 to down 7% in those long-only global tactical asset allocation strategies. 
but where we are not constrained to being long only and we can go long short, uh, we have some more alpha focused portfolios and those were up 20% um, on a net of fees basis for 2018. But again, like I said, these past performance is not indicative of future performance. This just gives you some sense of our portfolio performance in 2018. Simon asked, since your firm comes from high frequency trading background, do your portfolios trade very frequently? Thanks. Um, so in terms of the, the uh, trading frequency and the portfolio turnover, it, it's almost a, a parameter that we specify as we design investment mandates. So and we also take things into account, like is this uh, portfolio taxable or not? But just to give you a sense of some of the portfolios uh, for our taxable portfolios, our annual kind of portfolio turnover is, is around half a turn. And for those non-taxable portfolios, it's roughly two and a half times um, that, the, that results in the portfolio turnover. Karen asked, do you use deep learning for high frequency trading algorithms as well? So that's certainly been our um, background uh, is I just, at least the co-founders come from high frequency trading backgrounds and and they have historically used um, some of these smash strategies like deep learning in, in high frequency trading. What we found is high frequency trading has become such a, a crowded trade and it's been such a mature set of investment strategies that there's limited uh, alpha potential in those sets of strategies. So so what we've done is actually shied away from, from using high frequency trading and, and targeted to some of the more higher capacity markets. So as a result, um, the both the markets and these investment strategies aren't necessarily high frequency trading anymore. We, we look at more normalized um, more, more traditional sets of portfolio turnovers as, as I've outlined in, in the previous question about portfolio turnover. But that might give you a sense of, of how um, we have high frequency trading backgrounds, but we've actually pivoted away from that just so that we can target higher capacity strategies. Chang asked, what tools or libraries do you use to implement the deep learning strategies? Thanks. Um, a lot of this is unfortunately a proprietary set of uh, tools and strat libraries that we develop in-house. Um, I mean, uh, I think uh, if, if this is something of interest to you, feel free to send me an email and we can share some more details there. But um, unfortunately, I, I can't, uh, everything, a lot of things that we develop here are, are kind of proprietary in nature. Rohit asked, which algorithm is best for rebalancing portfolio and asset allocation? So we, um, when we think about using deep learning, uh, we, we rebalance our portfolios on a daily basis. Um, but we, we, what we try to do is we don't necessarily um, uh, rebalance it too, too much. And I say that because um, you're, 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 if, you, if you have the, the, um, the portfolios uh, trade too frequently, there's obviously a lot of uh, transaction costs that would be incurred. But also uh, you're, you're risking this, um, uh, almost overfitting by 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 changing the portfolio so much when when the signals may or may not be um, statistically significant. So so I mean we 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 look at the portfolios every day as as we we look at the the um, whether we need to do any rebalancing or whatnot. But um, as, as through through the different kind of strategies and and things that we overlay on top, we really only trade uh, where it's. It, I guess the, the markets are moving in a, in a way that is statistically significant that drives uh, our portfolios to need to rebalance, if that makes sense. Laurent asked, TAA are usually traded once a month. Is this the case too with your strategies? Thanks, Laurent. Um, no, uh, so we, we don't just trade on once a month basis. We, we dynamically trade on a daily basis as needed. But similar to the previous question, I think we, we definitely trade, uh, we have the ability to trade on, on a daily basis and, and we do. Uh, I'd say we probably trade every, Every few days is probably more realistic. Um, just trying to, to take into account transaction costs and turnover, and 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 for for accounts that are taxable, um, you know, it, just trading so frequently could result in a lot of taxes as well, which obviously would be punitive for the investor. So we when we think about the the optimal portfolio, we definitely take the the transaction costs and the after tax returns into account uh, in determining how frequently we want to trade. But definitely more than once a month. It's probably more like every few days or so. Um, our next question is, I noticed a dip near 2008-2009. Would you be able to tune the algo to avoid such case? Thanks. Um, so I think I, I, I'd like to kind of um, uh, just just put a precaution out there that, that like um, obviously these strategies are really powerful, but I wouldn't say that I've created a crystal ball and I can't say that I I've, I've have predicted the future using these strategies. So certainly what we what we try to do is 
um, we have these risk management pros, pro processes and protocols in place where um, if there are significant uh, underperformance or drawdowns in the portfolio, we will systematically de-risk the portfolio. And from there, um, because what we, we try to do is we, we don't want to um, double down or take more risk to learn about new market information. So in that 2008, 2009 scenario, I'd say that maybe there was a new piece of information or, or new regime or new paradigm we're in. And obviously it was very different than what it has learned in the past. And so we would systematically, like I say, de-risk the portfolio, learn about this new situation, wait for the portfolio to um, be calibrated to, to this new kind of regime we're in, and then systematically reallocate up yeah, the, uh, the, the, into the portfolio to make sure that we don't miss out on market performance, if that makes sense. JP asked, is your entire model 100% automated to the point you are just monitoring the trades, et cetera? So yes, thanks, JP. Um, we th this this end to end, this is end to end automated. Um, so yes, uh, we are monitoring the portfolios, and, and obviously th that's the case for um, I'd say any asset manager. They should be monitoring the portfolios on a continuous basis. Where we I'd say we we overlay a lot of human um, uh, oversight and, and and so forth is on as we develop it as, as we develop uh, strategies and and. Um, Make sure that uh, they're they're deployed in, in the right way. We are uh, making sure that there's a, a, a serious, um, rigorous tests and, and so forth that that humans kind of um, manage and oversee before it's incorporated blindly, and then and then we let the models run by itself. But but certainly we, we the, the whole process that I've, that I've outlined is automated and uh, is systematic in nature. So there isn't necessarily any need for um, a, a human to uh, take what has come out from the model, then then trade. Uh, it's 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 all uh, done automatically. Um, but where we add decide to new add new strategies or refine strategies and so forth, that's definitely where we we need the, the human oversight. Thanks, Calvin. Um, thank you, everyone. That concludes the question and answer portion of our webinar. For any attendees who are institutional investors, please know that Qplum offers AI-driven investment solutions that can be customized to best meet your needs. Please feel free to send any questions to contact at qplum, q -p -l -u -m .co. Um, Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar.